give it a second. And we're connected. Everything's connected. Okay, good, 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 good. First person to comment, get some kudos. Um, it is a bit weird, like, introducing the video and, you know, before people are here because so many people watch via the live stream. But, uh, yeah, I'll just introduce what we're doing today. Uh, we're going to be responding to a video. I mean, it's the video mentioned in the uh, in the title. It's called Turfs and False Consciousness. It's by, by this guy called Rosenkrauts. Um, now, there is kind of a, a funny story to go along with this. Oh, by the way, I should say I'm a little bit poorly. It's not so bad. Like, it's just... But also, it's kind of hard to tell because I felt a bit achy, which is often a sign of being poorly. But then, at the same time, it's 89% humidity right now where I am. So I feel, like, sweaty and clammy, which I think maybe, like, psychologically is making me think that, like, I'm ill, when actually it's just because it's horrible weather. Um, at least it's raining, though. So much for that drought that Project Fear was telling us all about. Anyway, so... Responding to a video called Rosenkraut, uh, there's a kind of vaguely funny story about this, actually. Um, not, not so funny, don't get too excited. Um, but essentially, when I responded to um, Ponderful, Ponderful mentioned me on Twitter, as some of you might remember. And then uh, this Twitter person called Rosen... So obviously I was looking at that because I was thinking, oh, I want to see what Ponderful said. And then this Twitter person called Rosenkraut um, said, oh... Uh, I wonder how he finds videos to respond to. If he responds to my upcoming video, then I'll know that he's just Googling the word turf and seeing what comes up or something like that. I don't know. I, for some reason, he thought that, like, me responding to him. But anyway, the funny thing is that one of the ways that I find um, people to respond to is by kind of, like, looking at the people I've already responded to and seeing who they associate with. And then if who they associate with is like a YouTuber or something like that, I'm like, oh, maybe they've got something to respond to. So with that said, this person was an example of that. So this person making that comment, I was like, oh, who are they? I'll go check them out. So that, yeah, that's kind of a funny story about how I found this person's content to respond to. But the thing is, it's ended up being a bit redundant because this video is kind of like in the grand scheme of things blown up. I say that it's got 7,811 views. But then you might be like, that's not really blowing up. But to be fair, like, you know, when you talk about videos about trans identity and all that kind of stuff, obviously as yeah, your contrapoints who get like millions of views. But to be honest, I would say if you clear 5k views as somebody talking about trans ID right now, you're not doing bad. So, you know, this, this video based on that logic is actually doing pretty all right. But yeah, I think we're just going to jump into it and start responding because it's quite a long video. Um, I suppose I should say I've checked out a bit of it and it seems to be like very, so I, I've used the, actually I haven't updated the thumbnail yet the uh, the thumbnail that i will be using as soon as i set it up is um like turf or sorry gender critical theory response so i think what i'm going to call it because this video seems to be very committed to like looking at the theory of being gender critical which you know i mean if you're perhaps similar to me in your mentality that's something which is probably going to um excite you to some degree so it is an hour long video, but I kind of don't think it should have too much going. Uh, hello, Gabriella. I believe you are in fact the first person to comment. I don't know. It's a, it's a bit, it's a bit deader than it usually is. I don't know. Funny thing is, I often don't stream on Tuesdays, but this time I was like, oh, I can stream on Tuesday, and I was like, well, I might as well because I feel a little bit rough. Which actually, you might be, you think, well, surely if you're rough, you wouldn't want to stream. But to be honest, streaming is relatively, you know, I don't want to say low effort, but you know. It's it's not too taxing, so yeah. I'm like, well, I might as well actually stream. So yeah, okay, let's jump into it. Uh, so you go like this, and oh, wrong video. Oh, let's try that again. Uh, I also did catch. I don't know. I felt like I screwed. I I clicked on the wrong thing. Um, I hope I didn't have anything too embarrassing up on my. Oh yeah, it's not too bad. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't expect to have anything embarrassing up, but um, yeah, I was just wondering. I was like, oh, but yeah, it's okay. Don't worry, everyone. We're fine. We're safe. Um, so yeah, with that said, we're on the right thing. Yeah, it did seem to screw up a bit, but like I clicked on it was like capture method. Uh, I'm not sure. I feel like, okay, I don't want to do that. I think I had it on that. But who knows? Maybe I switched it to a good thing. Anyway, all right. So we're going to, we're going to jump in. We're going to do this. Um, Normal speed, okay, boom. 
and um sorry it's not working someone's gonna have to be in charge of um like letting me know volume and all that kind of stuff look i i thought about it and i can't put up a content warning in front of every sentence in here that's potentially upsetting so we're just gonna do the whole thing transphobia and engaging with gender critical slash turf ideology is the whole deal this time so if that kind of content is a bit much for you right now, maybe sit this one out and come back if or when you feel inclined. So there's some bad stuff going around in the intellectual thunderdome that is gender-critical discourse. One common reaction to it, and indeed to TERFs in general, is to say lol lmao trans-exclusionary radical feminists? There's nothing feminist about that kind of ideology. I don't know, okay, um, uh... So yeah, I mean, to be fair, like, I just wanted to read that quote, but obviously that's not necessarily an argument this person is presenting. Uh, but if, if it is, then yeah, very quickly basically says, how can it be feminist when their actions harm women and uh, they're, they're allied with conservatives? So I don't know if that is presented as a sincere argument, I might respond to it. But right now I'm just going to assume that this isn't an argument necessarily that Rosencrantz is making. Although, they, I, I, you know, what? okay, screw it. I'll give a response to it real quick because it's a really easy thing to respond to. Uh, one does it harm women? No. The thing is, you can always say like, oh, it harms women in some way. But the problem is, that's a a really crap way of arguing that you're not an advocate for somebody. Because everything harms something in some way, or harms someone in some way. Like, you could easily say, how can you be a socialist when there are socialist regimes which have, um, you know, killed workers via, like, famine or uh, political purges because they were anti-revolutionary. How can you be, um, you know, a, a kind of black liberation movement when actually you harm uh, black people who just want to kind of get by in life and, you know, don't really want to concern themselves with your stuff and you're actually increasing the amount of antagonism in, in racial relations, things like that you can always say. And of course, with feminism, it's even easier. Like, you know, of course, um, you, they're always going to, like, for example, I could say, how can somebody be a feminist if they support the porn industry? Because the porn industry harms women. And, like, the thing is, okay, maybe you might think that's actually a legitimate line of inquiry, but the point I'm making is you can literally say this about anything, because the reality is that it's a big, complicated world, and it's always going to harm things. So I'm not even going to say, like, the gender-critical movement doesn't harm women. Because, yeah, I suppose there might be some unintentional harm. The real question is, does the gender-critical movement advocate, usually, for, because of course, you know, you can define gender critical in lots of ways, and not every single gender critical person is necessarily feminist, but whatever else, um, for the rights of women, the answer is very clearly yes. Um, you know, you might disagree, and you might say there are some instances where it fails to do so effectively, and therefore does harm women, you know, unintentionally, uh, or even intentionally. But the point is, as long as it's a movement which is uh, credibly, can credibly claim to be advocating for the rights of women, then I don't think you can argue that it's not feminist. Uh, and I think definitely, like, you look at my content, I can pretty, it's pretty clear I can credibly claim to be fighting for the rights of women. Does that mean that I'm uh, perfect to that? No. But, you know, the point is, yeah, like I say, I can credibly claim to. And the other question is, well, you know, they have alliances with the conservatives. And again, the point is, as long as you are in dealing with anything outside of just the pure, boring political binary, as long as you're a remotely kind of free-thinking person who actually is recognizing that maybe one time your tribe isn't going to be right about something, then you're going to form alliances with people on the opposite side of the political spectrum in some instances. So what? So there we go. Anyway, we'll see what else is said. Oh my god, they will act against women at the drop of a hat if it hurts a trans person. And look, I get it. It feels like a massive contradiction. A bold-faced one they just inhabit without a second thought. Stepping aside from the whole nobody has a totalizing definition of what feminism is argument, there's legacy to the word turf. I'm not gonna, okay, I just wanna say this right now. I'm not gonna read, like, the little kind of messages being put there, because I don't like how the messages, like, being written down are different from what's being said, and I don't wanna pause every single time to read every single message being written down. As far as I'm concerned, I'm just gonna ignore the messages written down. Pretty much same rule I usually have with responses. If something is worth including in the video, it's worth saying. It's not just worth, you know, including as a little aside. So I'm not going to read it. Um, maybe there's a fantastic point being made. But again, if it was worth including in the video, it should be worth saying. Um, and yeah, basically, so it seems like this person is actually arguing that, yeah, this, this argument has some legitimacy. And of course, it doesn't. 
and I'd like to explore that and how we get from second wave lesbian separatism to blue check marks allying with the Heritage Foundation. I so this is going to be some kind of history thing or whatever. Thought about if it was possible to make this video algorithm friendly, but I say the word lesbian uh, a lot. And for reasons that suck, that word, among many others, isn't algorithm friendly. Link to a video on that whole thing down below. Suffice to say, I'm not willing to replace the word lesbian with some cutesy innuendo and- <laughs> Yeah, because you don't want to replace the word lesbian, you just want to make it not mean anything, you blank. Sound like an unhinged TikToker for an hour? I just don't have it in me to call lesbians linguinis or whatever. Also, it behooves me to explain what this video is and what it is not. If you want to get into the ideological underpinnings typical to right-wing, Christian, and concerned parent framings of transphobia, those are more thoroughly discussed elsewhere. Kaylin Conrad has a whole series- Ah, uh, good, okay, yep, yeah, already responded to that. that goes and the fact that this person has any respect for Kaylin Conrad's videos shows that they're not worth taking seriously. ...goes into some of the origins, but more so focuses on the process by which one falls into and sustains the ideology. Hello, Lisa. Good to see you. Which is super interesting. This video is about the- Someone says, what channel is this? This channel is called Rosenkrauts. Um, this is a kind of, I guess, breakout hit of sorts. I <laughs> It's not that great. You know, like, it's, it's done okay. But like, so it, it's basically just a small channel, which I think this is really the only substantial video. So there we go. History of the ideology of the gender critical movement. And before you say, but Mia Mulder are- See, Okay, here's the thing, I just want to say this real quick. Um, like, it's interesting that if this video is actually going to be a sincere look at gender-critical ideas and gender-critical theory, then you have to wonder, how can this person be promoting Caitlin Conrad? Because Caitlin Conrad clearly knows nothing about the gender-critical movement. So either this person knows, knows something about the gender-critical movement, in which case they are being incredibly cynical by- uh, you know, recommending Kaylin Conrad's video because they would know that Kaylin Conrad's video is a load of crap. Or alternatively, they don't know anything about the gender critical movement, in which case who cares what they have to say. Already did a video on the history of transphobia. Yes, she did. And she worked with me on this one. I am not stepping on her toes. I promise the- This video is so defensive. <laughs> ...nuanced difference is important. I won't touch on every member of the gender critical movement because like, I've, it's never occurred to me to like start a video being like, I'm aware some people have also made videos about this, but let me explain why that's okay. It's like, it's fine. That would take a very long time. Like, I could discuss the sex wars and third wave and Greer and a dozen contemporary figures of the gender critical and rad femme organizations, but rather than do that, I think it's best to just choose a few people to demonstrate the general trajectory of things. Sorry if I miss out on your personal antagonist. And no, there won't be much room to talk about jowling, cowling, rowling. I am discussing the, hmm, I'll call it the intellectual wing, the ideological vanguard of gender criticals, the legacy of how some radical feminists Hey Joan of Arc. Oh, good to see we've got a non-binary person here. began to specify their trans-exclusionary nature. That said, I am in no way attempting to legitimate their ideology, but to track certain ideological roots. I do not intend to draw any extrapolations from this regarding the broader movements of feminism and lesbian thinkers. Being a lesbian is not a red flag. Taking up certain second wave talking points is maybe a yellow flag that someone's ideology is a bit dated, but it would be unfair to paint with a broad brush there. So Don't worry everyone, you're allowed to believe in feminism still. Good news. Suffice to say, there are many writers and thinkers revered by contemporary gender critical thought leaders and indeed part of the rad femme movement historically that have either made a clear distance from the exclusionary radical feminist wing or have outright condemned it. Yeah, this is disappointing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's fine. It's fine, I guess. Like people are allowed to be wrong about stuff. It's just disappointing. Today I'll be talking about the conflict between the ideological roots of the gender critical movement, which does indeed have an ideology, and the possibly obvious rival that is queer theory. There are, of course, reasons why that antagonism is inherited by queer individuals, or really I should say why the gender criticals continue to target queerness and transness with the trappings of attacking an ideology. See also their use of the- 
It is an ideology. Phrase transgenderism and what ism imply. It implies that it's an ism because it is an ism. It's, but before we can get to that conflict, we need... Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Like, yeah, gender critical isn't the same thing as radical feminist. I mean, maybe this person's using the word turf, like, you know, um, in a very literal sense, like just saying. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I'm, I recognize that I couldn't really call myself a radical feminist. Um, although, you know, yeah, like I say, there are some radical feminists I like. Having said that, there are probably some radical feminists I don't like. I mean, you know, I don't know. I mean, I say, like, obviously, I mean, when I say personally, I mean, like, I'm wondering whether or not, you know, there are probably radical feminists who I agree with, and there may be some radical feminists who I wouldn't necessarily agree with, whatever. We need to talk about feminist scholar Monique Vitigue, women's liberation, and a very specific homosexual agenda. I feel like this might uh, have um, Loris very infused, because I think Loris has mentioned a lot of, like, Loris has definitely mentioned Monique Vitigue, so I, I really, you know, actually... I know this person has apologized profusely for potentially stepping on some people's toes, but I would like to apologize on this person's behalf for the fact that, uh, Loris, this person might be stepping on your toes. Like, I'm very concerned that you might be sat there watching me hear all of your deepest, darkest beliefs. I don't know I said darkest. Um, you know, your, your deepest convictions uh, being expressed by somebody else. Um, so, yeah. And it would be very annoying for you if this person doesn't do a good job, but we'll see. To front load things, Vitigue is not bad. I feel bad for dragging her into this, but we are here to discuss ideological roots. Just be mindful that for where all of this goes, Vitigue is not the point at which things are doom-driven. She is, I would argue, a juncture. Monique Vitigue was a French lesbian feminist writer in the... wait, there we go. Lesbian feminist in the political slash ideological sense, like not just a feminist who happens to be a lesbian. Vitigue wrote her most pivotal work in the 70s and 80s, both in the form of fiction that captured people's imaginations and in theory that caught the attention of philosophers and pulled from the legacy of other second wave feminists like Beauvoir, who you may have heard of. To be brief here, Beauvoir wrote The Second Sex, a book considered pivotal to the development of second wave feminism as a whole. Within the book is a particular line that has stood out to most anyone who reads it. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. The work by Vitigue that we'll be looking at today is inspired by- I will say I've made a video on that quote before, so I suppose I'll link to it probably here. I entitled after that very line. I didn't make this graphic. This is probably the coolest cover of a PDF I've ever seen. Let's look at that quote right there. It is our material task and only ours. Historical task. It's fine though. Who needs to read? To define what we call oppression in materialist terms, to make it evident that women are a class, which is to say that the category woman as well as the category man are political and economic categories, not eternal ones. Our fight aims to suppress men as a class, not through a genocidal, but a political struggle. Once the class men disappears, women as a class will disappear as well, for there are no slaves without masters. Okay, um, so just want to say real quick, by the way, one, um, yeah, Lisa Michelle, I mean, I will say this, like, this is so far, like, a considerable step up from Kaylin Conrad, um, because, you know, like, obviously, uh, but, yeah, like, which, again, makes you wonder, why is this person recommending Kaylin Conrad? But, um, then, basically, so, so, I also wanted to say that I anticipate there's going to be a lot of me sat there while stuff is just said. Like, this is not going to be a um, pausing every... Like, I think it's going to be like a consistent slow trickle of pausing rather than huge periods of time where I've got nothing to say and then moments of time where it's like I've got something to say every second or something. Because, yeah, like, it seems like there's going to be a lot of just long things from other people's, you know, like, work, and then analyzing it and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we'll see how this comment is analyzed. I'm not interested in responding to that Monique Wittig quote itself, because it's not a response to Monique w Is it, like, pronounced some kind of wrong way, like Wittig or something? I can't remember. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to respond to that myself. How TERFs read that and somehow turn that into what TERFs now believe is astonishing. One of Wittig's central points... Well, hold on a minute, like, I'm sorry, but... Not every single, like, that, 
you're saying that as if like that's the foundational quote for gender critical feminism and it obviously isn't so how many views does this video have uh over seven thousand seven thousand and something something is differentiating lesbians from women in a class metaphor she relates them to being class conscious and maybe you see a hiccup with that idea save that thought well i mean i i can see a hiccup with the idea of differentiating lesbians from women um i can definitely see a hiccup with that for the critique section the work as a whole spends some time trying to define women define the class structure present and define Surely spending any time trying to define women automatically puts um, this person at odds with the uh, modern TRA movement. Define lesbians, providing justification for why they are not women. Now, mind you, when she says that, she doesn't mean to imply that they're trans, merely that gender and sex provide class distinctions. In other parts, she also talks about what it is to become a man, and... Um... this also should be understood in her class framework, not as identity per se. To put it simply, her definition of a lesbian is reliant on understanding that women are, from the start, only defined in relation to men. One is not born a woman, after all. Now, what defines a What part of from the start like i don't know like i just don't get why these people just say like such obviously stupid contradictory things and again it doesn't even like matter hello rad mum uh i saw your video today about um oh and here i am like totally forgetting what the video is about oh jammy dodger big um uh, or rather did i see it um i saw it i saw a portion of it let's say um because i believe i hope i'm right about this i believe it was premiering today um I'm just like, I'm hoping that it wasn't like they actually glitched on a different video and uh, like, anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. Basically, um, I think, I think, it, yeah, you premiered a video today. I don't know what I'm on about. Okay, whatever. Anyway, uh, the thing is basically very minor point, but the claim of from the start and one is not born, like those, those two things, it's, it's contradictory, right? Because if it's from the start then you are born that way um uh and yeah i'm i'm yeah i'm impressed with your uh your editing rad mum um it's very good uh round of applause and everyone everyone who's here right now it's not not so many people so it's probably not gonna be the biggest boost in the world but um if you haven't already you can subscribe to rad mum um i reckon you can probably just click on her channel uh so yeah anyway um Oh yeah, okay, we're good. We've got some other like rad mum fans here. Um, yeah, so there we go. Just, just like a funny little weird contradiction. Woman is the class relation she has to men. Beauvoir would refer to this as the marked sex. Men are the default. Women are defined by relation to men, but lesbians provide a disruption. Okay, I want to say real quick. First of all, one, like some of the stuff being said, it's sort of like, it's just a statement and like I think in order for me to react to it there'd need to be some kind of justification for it um like obviously the claim lesbians aren't women like I'm not going to sit here and respond to the question of whether or not lesbians are women um I'm instead going to or you know the suggestion that lesbians aren't women obviously what I'm going to do is just wait until someone makes because as far as I'm concerned there's no good argument for the claim that lesbians aren't women, therefore I'm not going to respond to it. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, like, this whole thing of, like, women being defined in relation to men. Um, yes, that's probably true historically. Um, but again, like, I guess there I'm just left wondering, what, what are you getting out of that? Like, I think if someone just makes that claim of, like, historically women are defined in relation to men... That's an okay claim to make, but I'm just wondering what's supposed to, you know, where it's going after that. Hello, Dr. Dankis Mus Maximus. Dr. Dankimus Maximus. There we go. Sorry, that's way, yeah, way easier to pronounce once I realize what it said. Their relation to women is... Um, I'm going to cautiously click that link you just posted. Oh, am I? Uh...
Oh, maybe I'm not. I can't actually. I can't actually see it. You're doing a good job at distracting me. Um, oh, that's interesting. I can't actually see. Oh, wait, Doi, you posted it on Twitch, didn't you? I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. Someone just knock on my door. No. Uh, okay. I'm mostly clicking on this because I think I know your name. Uh, grilled sausage on thermal camera. Okay, that was so worth my time. I feel like... I feel like you're just totally razzing me. Uh, okay. Is as one who desires them, taking up that male relation dynamic while also rejecting the desire by men. And so the relations of the lesbian to men and to women are both disrupted. Wait, I'm going to go that real quick. Wait. By this as the marked sex. Men are the default, women are defined by relation to men, but lesbians provide a disruption. Their relation to women is as one who desires them, taking up that male relation dynamic while all Surely their relation to women is being women. Like, okay, whatever. Also rejecting the desire by men. And so the relations of the lesbian to men and to women are both disrupted in this. The lesbian exists in a third category. Why? Why? Why does being attracted to women not being attracted to men mean you exist in the third category? And the class relations of the categories are what we call genders. As such, to Vatigue, the lesbian is not a woman and is indeed a gender. But why? <laughs> like, that doesn't make any... I don't know, like, it's just like, at the end of the day, the thing is, like, I'm, I'm so willing for there not to be a justification provided because I'm so confident that any justification provided would just be complete nonsense. Like, just lesbians are women. Like, it's kind of weird because, like, if lesbians aren't women, then, like, how are they even lesbian? At that point, aren't they just, like, straight dudes, right? Like, surely the whole point of, like, lesbian is that it's a way of describing the fact that you have, you know, as is typically the case, a woman and a man. You know, that's like the usual pairing. But it's different because instead, with gay relationships, it's a woman and a woman, or a man and a man. So, but the thing is, if you're saying actually it's not a woman and a woman, then who even cares? Like, at that point, what are you even talking about? Also, I'm also a bit confused because surely, like, lesbians aren't just attracted to women. They're also, or like, they're attracted to women. And in addition, or m furthermore, they're attracted a lot of the time to other lesbians. So I guess in this logic, lesbians aren't attracted to women. They're attracted to women and lesbians because apparently lesbians aren't women. And that's just kind of dumb. Like, again, the problem is, what is the reason why it makes sense to understand the word lesbian that way? Loris has commented something. Loris said that they were a fan of uh, Monique. Uh, so, because in gender terms, men and women are defined by their heterosexual relation to each other, so falling outside of that heterosexual contra contract means you are no longer a woman. Why should that be the case, though? Like, why is that the way to understand men and women? Like, why, why does that make sense as the way to understand men and women, as opposed to biological sex or anything else like i don't understand this logic of and again like that creates question okay what about like single women or what about like asexual women what about like what about bisexual yeah what about bisexual women like a bisexual women like half people half not it's like like when they're attracted to women or you know women or lesbians because you've got to bear in mind lesbians aren't women so women or lesbians um or bisexual women of course same so you got that. So a bisexual woman, she's either attracted to a woman, a lesbian, or a bisexual woman. And when she's attracted to a woman, a lesbian, or a bisexual woman, oh, sorry, a, a bisexual maybe woman. We've got to be clear about this. So uh, when a, a woman is a bisexual, a bisexual maybe woman, because sometimes she's attracted to women or lesbians or 
bisexual, possibly women. Um, so in the, when she's attracted to that, is she no longer a woman? But then sometimes because she's bisexual, or sorry, she or they, because she might not be a woman, or they might not be a woman, um, when she's attracted to men, then she becomes a woman again. So she's like kind of Schrodinger's woman, right? Is that how like biological... Oh, sorry, bi so a bisexual woman, like are they are they half women, half not? You can see the issue. And like that's the thing. Like it's so easy to do this, to just be like, to point out, well, how does this actually make sense? How does it actually because the problem is I feel like this is just like poetic bullshit. Like that's what it is basically. It's just like, oh well, when you think about it, like, aren't women and men defined in relation to each other? So aren't lesbians not women, blah blah blah. But then you like think, okay, actually, okay, let's ignore this as just like a poetic thing to say into the ether, and instead be like actually take it as a genuine attempt to describe reality accurately and then you try and unpack what it's actually saying and it just goes all over the place again like who who is attracted to who and it's just it's just really weird um like yeah the whole thing's weird and um there's no logic to it and then conversely you just think like oh god isn't it just so much simpler to just say a woman is a biological female and a man is a biological male. And it's like, hey, is that lesbian a woman? Instead of having to go, well, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, they're defined in relation to men that they, they wouldn't be. Or, OK, let's I mean, let's go for the funny one, which is the bisexual. So, yeah, hey, is that bisexual, biological female a woman? And rather than having to do this whole weird thing of like, well, sometimes if they're attracted, but maybe they're not and blah, blah, blah. Rather than doing that, you just say, well, they're biologically female. So, yes. Like, that just seems to make more sense. Sex, gender, and class are more or less interchangeable in this framework. It's useful because it relates to people's real phenomenological sense of gender. Lesbians fall so completely outside the way the gender system is set up to the point lesbianism was an oversight. But, like, how? And also, like, at that point, you're opening up, like, such a massive can of worms. Because then it's like, well, what about people who are really gender non-conforming? What about nuns? Like, it's just, it's so much more needlessly complicated. And of course, the problem is it also, of course, like, creates an issue as far as feminism is concerned. Because at that point, like, it, the, the easy way to, like, do feminism would be to say, well, there are women, and women are biological females, and if you're a biological female, aka a woman, you can be anything you want to be. Gender does not have to restrict you at all. But here you get this weird thing of, like, actually, you're a biological female, but you are only a woman depending on your conformity to gender. And it's like, who benefits from that as like a way of understanding this concept of woman? It seems like just totally unnecessary. And of course, when you consider the fact that pronouns are usually understood to refer to men and women rather than biological males and biological females, you're then basically saying that like how we should refer to other people and in a really quite fundamental sense, understand other people should be entirely in relation to their conformity to traditional gender and heteronormativity. And that just seems like dumb. Like, I feel like I should be able to say she or whatever else um, and not have to wonder whether or not actually the woman's a lesbian. Sorry, the person is a lesbian and therefore I'm being inaccurate. Like, isn't that just weird? And also, like, what if they're, like, not, like, really a lesbian? You know how, like, sometimes you'll get, like, heterosexual girls who will just kind of um, be a little bit, you know, like, saucy with other girls um, for, for whatever reason, for, let's say, um, performative reasons. Obviously, in the adult film industry, this is a very common thing. In that case, like, are, are, they, are they still women or are, or, or are they just, you know, something other than women? Because obviously a lot of the time, they're not actually lesbians, right? Like they're, you know, straight, but they're just doing girl-girl stuff for money, like as part of their job. So I guess, like, are they, they're like, they're not people for pay? It just all seems a bit weird. Um, Colton Marcus says, lol, want my hot take. Well, you know, I don't know. As long as it's not about Israel, because <laughs> I don't want the chat to descend into that again. But that's not to say she doesn't think biology exists or that there aren't material class differences among women. And you can't have class without the potential for some manner of class consciousness. Now you can't have class without ass.
that's what I would have liked. <laughs> and then it just descends into like this really intense. Um, do you believe people are biologically gay or straight? No, I mean I, I'm not sure what you mean exactly by biologically. Um, so I, I would say maybe maybe ask that question slight. So it's like slightly clearer exactly what you're asking, just so I can. Um, make sure that I give you an accurate answer. Now, consciousness works its way into this essay in two senses. One, when discussing the idea that one can be a lesbian politically, and that this is the role of any true feminist, thus the bit I mentioned before. The second way is in defining false consciousness, which we're going to look at more because it gives us a framework we'll use later. In some sense, this idea lays bare a lot of ongoing and future points of contention within feminism. Okay, so the question was, do you think people are born as gay or straight? Um, now, I don't know, like, my genuine take would be, I, I wouldn't claim to know for certain. Like, I mean, it could be, you know, it could be all sorts. Um, so, like, I guess I would say that the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, kind of, what's the word? Like, the kind of consensus, that's it, um, seems to be that people are born gay or straight. So I guess I would say, well, if that's the consensus, it could well be right. But it's not something where I have like my own opinions about it, really. Um, yeah, so whatever. Um, Lisa Michelle doesn't like political lesbianism. Um, of course people are born gay slash het. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, there's also bisexual. I don't know. Like, I mean, I know that's a bit of a nitpicky point to bring up, but it's like obviously, um, you know, like people, people are born you know, different things. But I guess if you're just saying, like, are people born... Like, but then I guess I'm wondering, like, are people born with all sexualities? Like, is, are people who are asexual, like, not attracted to anybody, are they all born? Um, heterosexual women are proof that people don't choose their sexuality. Yeah, I have heard that as a comment. Um, Laura says it was a tool to get people to accept... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, like, couldn't it be that, like... Like, there's a difference... The thing is, it's not... There's a difference between saying it's a choice and saying you're born of it, because it's also possible that something that emerges due to kind of, what's the word, like epigenetics, like kind of genetics evolving as you kind of grow up due to environmental factors and things like that, but I don't know. In short, the women are wonderful, girl boss style movements do not seek to dismantle the sexed class structure, but to reinforce it with the false consciousness and mythologization mixed with biological essentialism. This is not... Yeah, not an emphasis on the differing needs of women, but on the differing characteristics as defined by gendered perceptions and concepts. False consciousness leads to upholding the roles and marks put upon women by men to distinguish them from men. Vitigue would not argue that women are identical. Yeah, I would agree. Like we should like being gay is fine either way. Like even if people did choose it, or well, someone wants to choose it. Or someone just wants to give it a go for funsies, you know, um, that's fine. Well, you know, they should probably not be doing that because they should get married first, you know. Um, you know, shouldn't be, especially with monkeypox. ...to men, but that arguments for setting women apart tend to rely on and reconstruct class distinction. It is from here noted hey. that women are... But that arguments for setting women apart tend to rely on and reconstruct class distinction. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's... Okay, is this... I don't know what it means by reconstruct class distinction. Like, is it... Does, does it mean economic class? Or just, like, class as in, like, just a group? Because obviously, like, if you're setting something up... Like, that just seems like a truism, surely? Like, of course, if you're setting a group apart, then you are defining and like reconstructing class distinction because you're like that's kind of like class distinction it's kind of just saying like it's like you could literally turn that phrase exactly around you could be like class distinction relies on setting a group apart and it's like yeah that, that would also be true it is from here noted that women are arguably identifying themselves by their oppression by their impoverished conditions and that well let's move on to a connected thought Vitigue also provides us with this. 
Matriarchy is no less heterosexual than patriarchy. It is only the sex of the oppressor that changes. Though a bit mundane and a given today, the idea was novel in its time and a strong response to both people accusing the movement of reverse sexism and trying to push people away from flip the script patriarchy idealizing. Make special note of the idea of an oppressor sex because once we get to actual gender critical territory, oppressor sex will be a noteworthy term. When Vitigue says lesbians are not women, it must be taken in the way she meant it, seeing the sexes as class distinctions and lesbians as, by their own distinction, outside the women class. I don't think that's like, it must be taken the way someone meant it. Oh, like, obviously you should take everything the way someone meant it, but that doesn't mean that you have to accept it as true based on the fact someone meant it a particular way. Like, so that's kind of the thing. Like, if I say that, um, I don't know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and that's too inaccessible to people who aren't British. Uh, if I say Donald Trump is black, and then someone says why, and I say, well, you know, because like he was born in America, and everyone born in America is black. Um, then was he even born in America? I think he was. Um, then you can take that statement the way I meant it, but obviously that doesn't make it true. So yeah, it's kind of the same thing here. Like if someone says lesbians aren't women, I'm happy to take that statement exactly the way they meant it, but I might also dismiss it based upon the way that they meant it. Uh, anyway. And that's the moment of juncture. From here on, lesbian is a political identification, which is not to say that queer people, as with non-white people, are erstwhile not politicized or were not until this moment, but that an intended... I actually want to know what Lisa Michelle's issue is with political lesbianism. Um, not to say that I, you know, think it's illegitimate to have an issue with it, but just because, like, it's not, you know, obviously, I mean, it would be entirely inappropriate for me to have much of an opinion on it. Um, I mean, you know, like, I, I could, I'm not saying, like, I couldn't have an opinion, obviously I can have an opinion on anything, but it's just, like, not really on my radar or something. Radar? I already became a, that's a West Country there. Radar. Radar as something, something for me to have an opinion on. Did politic coalesced in this moment, lesbian feminist went from lowercase to uppercase. Some people took this as a point of ideological purism from which there could be no intersectionality. That women must fight for the good of women and can only do so without men. Vitigue herself leans in that direction, but as we'll see, this is partially due to a lack of consideration for the future values and variables that are other queer ideas. Oh, okay, that's, I mean, that's a pretty, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like, intuitive reason, I guess what I'm saying. Like, you know, obviously that, that makes sense, the reason not to agree with it. I thought you might have, um... There's never been an equivalent of political lesbianism for men. Isn't that kind of like what they had in Sparta? Like, I don't know, like, I feel like, or isn't that like basically every single, like, like, isn't that just every rugby club? right like they're all gay like they're all a bunch of kind of um you know misogynistic alpha males and they're all gay but if not rugby clubs and at least sparta like you know weren't they all a bunch of misogynistic alpha males who are all gay um or prison gangs misogynistic alpha males who are all gay uh and so on identities Vitigue is writing in the presumption that cis men, women, gays, and lesbians are more or less the whole conversation. Now Hold on, wait, wait, I just realized, obviously, I guess the reason, I mean, you know, like, it just goes to me, like, obviously the reason, I guess, why there's no, like, is because, well, I don't know. I don't really understand the whole Mugtow thing. But, like, obviously, like, what do they do? Do they just transcend sexual impulse because the thing is like i couldn't really imagine mugtows like at least advocating for like maybe they do it behind the scenes but i couldn't imagine them like advocating for consuming you know adult content because i would assume that they would say that's kind of degenerate and like obviously like they seem like the kind of people who would argue you should try to overcome those baser um you know desires and that kind of stuff like it doesn't seem like they'd be advocating for everyone whacking off all the time um but um like so then 
what are so what are they doing like how are they blowing <laughs> their loads or are they just not oh, I, I never even thought about that like i've never thought about how do mugtows actually you know achieve any sort of release um I've experienced a lot of harassment from women, so I get it. Uh, well, yeah, that's the issue I have with being like such a sexy dude. Um, hold on, I just realized Top Gun. That's Top Gun is the male equivalent to political lesbianism. Uh, we finally arrived at it. Now, yes, queer people existed in 1980, as did trans people, and they were part of the discussion. But in terms of being a weighty political. Oh, I know what it is. They probably are just into like 2D girls, right? Like anime and all that, body pillows. Oh, the like the sex robots. Like, are they into those? I bet they are. Well, faction gay organizations were far more present, and lesbian organizations were more emergent. All that said, I do not know her view on transness, but she did pass the incredibly low bar of having no outspoken bigotries on record before her death, which is not the case for where we're headed next. Her idea that lesbians constitute a separate material class, a gender, if you will, is a fascinating one. From that wording- I mean, sorry, can I just say, like, this person is definitely not gender critical by any means. Like, obviously, defining a woman based on their heterosexuality is very much not gender critical. I think it becomes clear what the other juncture is and how her ideas can be syncretic with queer realities. For me personally, Vitigue is an inspiration for finding the right language to discuss the ways in which trans women cannot become women in the sense of a class structure, that trans men do not elevate their class, obtain utter liberation from misogyny, so much as enter a different category. Now, I'm trying to be very deliberate here. I am not saying that trans people aren't real men or women. I am merely explaining an example of how Vitigue's structure lends itself to articulate models for discussion that need concise language. That said, those discussions are rightfully put on the back burner because of how easy it is for all manner of phobes to brush away the nuance and say, look, look, X person said trans men can't ever be men, ha ha, they admitted it, ha ha. We aren't in a place of comfort where nuance and exploring language like this is easy. To be more concise about all that, the juncture is that of lesbianism as a political identity versus lesbians as a politicized people. And maybe you see where this bleeds into gender criticals and their relation to isms. We aren't quite done with fatigue yet. There's the matter of critique. Now this is a bit of a detour from the history and philosophy of gender criticals, but I find it necessary to grasp the Okay, I feel like we're not going to have much to say to this. I kind of still have some pasta next to me, so I might try and work my way through some of that pasta based on the fact I don't think I'm going to have much to say. Ups and downs of fatigue before moving on to the stuff that has no ups. Queer theorist and fashionable blazer wearer Judith Butler has something to say about Vitigue's essay. In their work Gender Trouble, Butler makes note of Vitigue's approach to the categories of sex, gender, and sexuality. For fatigue, there is no distinction between sex and gender. The category of sex is itself a gendered category, fully politically invested, naturalized, but not natural. From here, Butler goes into certain critiques. In response to Beauvoir's notion one is not born a woman but rather becomes one, fatigue claims that instead of becoming a woman, one, anyone, can become a lesbian. By refusing the category of women, Vitigue's lesbian feminism appears to cut off any kind of solidarity with heterosexual women and implicitly to assume that lesbianism is the logically or politically necessary consequence of feminism. This kind of separatist perspectivism is surely no longer viable. But even if it were politically desirable, what criteria would be used to decide the question of sexual identity? If to become a lesbian is an act, a leave-taking of heterosexuality, a self-naming that contests the compulsory meaning of heterosexualities, women and men, what is it to keep the name of lesbian from becoming an equally compulsive category? What qualifies as a lesbian? Does anyone know? If a lesbian refutes the radical disjunction between heterosexual and homosexual economies that Vitigue promotes, is that lesbian no longer a lesbian? And if it is an act that founds the identity as performative accomplishment of sexuality, are there certain kinds of acts that qualify over others as foundational? 
Can one do the act with a straight mind? Can one understand lesbian sexuality not only as a contestation of the category? Yeah, I believe Judas Butler's the they then as of now. So yeah, basically, I mean, I will say, like, um, <sighs> Judith Butler, like, uh, some of these criticisms, like, the whole thing of, like, what does lesbian mean, like, blah, 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 um, is kind of the point, like, I was getting at, right, where I said, like, so what about, like, if, especially if, like, you're advocating for political lesbianism, because at that point, you're basically advocating for people who aren't even lesbian, or, you know, like, aren't even, like, authentically attracted to members of the same sex, just doing it for other reasons, at which point it's like, well, in that case, you know, like I say, what about in girl on girl adult films are they lesbians like are they authentically lesbians like so that's the thing like that whole kind of thing of what exactly when you get down to the nitty-gritty of every possible reason why somebody might ever engage in any act with a member of the kind of same sex what exactly makes somebody a lesbian um and obviously that seems what Judith butler is asking so yeah like obviously i would agree with that as a line of inquiry again like obviously from my perspective like i would say what makes them a lesbian is much kind of easier to define but also a less significant thing because i would argue lesbians are women so therefore you know like i don't have to get into this whole thing about like what does it mean to be a lesbian as a way of understanding what it means to be a woman um but yeah like so basically i would say i, I agree with some of what you was saying but obviously i have no reason to really engage with it because you know this is just a fight between two people who i don't agree with of sex of women of natural bodies but also of lesbian i could spend all day quoting sections of butler's work but this is the most salient element for our purposes i'm not even sure i have to put it in my own words here butler has asked the right questions in simple enough terms my own critique of lesbian separatism is one of practice that it sort of results in a construction of parallel powers and a boycott of patriarchy or Perhaps it's more sufficient to compare it to the aspirations of a general strike or even a dual power structure. Maybe that's the most charitable read, but that leads to the other concern. It doesn't wholly diminish the power of those who already have it unless it reaches the level of a general strike and a mass consciousness and all that. And to do so, it requires understanding sexuality not just as a politicized identity, but as one assumed for political purposes. Oh, by the way, my um, biceps totally better. Now time to blast again. Purposes. More people would need to be on board than there are lesbians, if you follow. And that goes into the second critique, which is that it makes sexuality into a political choice. To opt into a class, or as Butler said, a consequence of feminism. Lesbianism becomes a political choice more than someone's truth, a real ism in the vein of ideologies. As discussed, this doesn't mean like scissoring to own the man. It means drawing a hard class line between men and women. I don't know what lysistrata is. Women and lesbians, and on some level, casting heterosexuality as an act of enslavement or the action of a class traitor. It means seeing straightness as an act against women's interests, and that eventually leads to some dark places, which we'll get to. Viti oh no. Won't someone please think about the straight people? I don't know, it's just really funny to like, like, kind of be concerned about the idea of like, um, you know, the gays are going to start taking away all the straight people's rights. Higgs' notion of a lesbian vanguard for radical feminism does not, in the end, provide a practical and actionable goal. I'd even argue that lesbian separatism has a nihilistic streak to do with respect to futurity, but bringing the child into all this, that's something I'll table for another video. Hey, what was that phrase I just used? Radical feminism? Where have I seen that phrase before? Does lesbian separatism, i.e. political lesbianism, put the RF in turf? Maybe. Certainly in part. So who put the TE in turf? Janice Raymond is an American lesbian feminist <sighs> scholar. Finally most famous for her 1979 work, The Transsexual Empire. But she has since written other works, and notably centered her focus instead on sex work and trafficking. I bring this up because it is the inverse of the trend among other lesbian feminist scholars, and the popular perception of TERFs, who have tended to lose sight of women's causes in favor of emphasizing the trans debate. 
I don't think you can say J.K. Rowling has lost sight of women's causes. Um, she's like, oh, wait, sorry. Sorry, I didn't realize this. J.K. Rowling uh, expressed some kind of personal, individual support to somebody who disagrees with her politically. Sorry, okay, I changed my mind entirely. Clearly, she's lost sight of women's causes. With respect to her work, we'll largely be focusing on the transsexual empire and a few outside bits written to accompany or explain it, like her website. By virtue of the timing of publication, Vitigue and Raymond are not in dialogue with one another. Transsexual Empire predates Vitigue's essay by about a year, but Vitigue does a good job introducing political lesbianism, and that's important to grasp before getting to what is essentially the Bible of trans exclusion. It is, in no uncertain terms, the source of many gender-critical talking points that are passed around to this day. Some of them have since been updated or repackaged, but generally, they're familiar to anyone who follows GC arguments. I won't be digging- I should probably reread the book. When I first read it, I was not gender critical, and I haven't read it since. Digging too deep here because, well, speaking frankly, digging deep with this book means scratching one's nails against stone. Like any normal reading of a book, let's begin with the appendix. Yeah, okay, admittedly that's weird, but as a small tip for doing readings of large texts, especially in history, it can be really helpful to read sections based on relevance, and the appendix, rather temptingly, is subtitled Suggestions for Change. Of course, to understand the suggestions, one needs a general knowledge of what she's talking about, and I had that going into this thanks to Mia's video. If you want a better picture of the tone and words of the book in general, it's in there. The Appendix of Transsexual Empire attempts to provide a practical answer to the question, okay, so what do we do about all this? And as such, is rather instructive for our purposes. Interesting to note here is that Raymond does not advocate for legal intervention against surgery, and indeed wishes to put aside that discussion. The prevention of transsexual surgery and the social conditions that generate it are not achieved by legislation forbidding surgery. Rather, it is more important to regulate, by legal measure, the sexist social conditions that generate transsexual surgery. And just for record, I would agree with all of this myself. So there you go. Uh, very woke. And also, legally, to limit the medical institutional complex that translates these sexist conditions into the realm of transsexualism. Beyond that, we get to a familiar talking point, the targeting of gender clinics. It must be clarified that, to the exclusionary lesbian feminist, real trans people do not exist. It follows, then, that transsexualism is, to those like Raymond, an attempt to fix a problem the wrong way. And so things like clinics are actually sexist because they seek to destroy women or enable oppressors. Yes. Okay, let's give an example. In the view of Raymond, there is no such thing as a trans man. There is merely a woman who is confused. Is the essayist where? Well, whatever, anyway. When the trans man, who, again, to Raymond, is merely a confused butch lesbian, goes to a clinic, the clinic will tell her that she's a man and a firm in the wrong direction. Note here the concept of critical awareness. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I suspect this is like, you know, a dude who, you know, is kind of obnoxious, like kind of a Sean type, like that's my suspicion. Like a guy who likes to think of himself as a big ally of women, but is also deeply misogynistic in reality. Or, or a Borsch, you know consciousness, as that will come back, and indeed is likely borrowed from the materialist approach of fatigue, class, class consciousness, etc. Let's step outside of- Well, hold on a minute, like, consciousness raising was a thing in, like, really early on in the gender- sorry, not in the gender critic- in second wave feminism. Like, the whole idea of consciousness raising was not invented by Raymond or fatigue the book for a second and into some of her follow-up material. On her website, there's a whole fact in fiction section dedicated to debunking claims that Raymond is transphobic. In it, in the section specifically dedicated to the transphobia claim, she responds to the question, are you a transphobe, with 
claims that people refuse to engage her book in its ideas and that she's being maligned and that people... I mean, look, the appropriate response to are you a transphobe is shut up. I don't care about even engaging with that as a term like that exists. Like, I, it's just not something I have any interest in even talking about as a term. I don't really think like the idea of transphobia is really kind of a legitimate concept. So that's the appropriate response. So what Raymond's doing here of basically not really engaging with the question directly is kind of appropriate. I think it's appropriate to engage with the question directly by directly saying that the question is nonsense. People don't like her, which fair enough. Shall we do a like spike, everybody? I think we should do a like spike and a three. I mean, first of all, you've got to get your, um, your you know, cursor over that like button. And then, and a three, and a two, and a one. A like spike. And, and then do a like spike. There we go. And fair enough. And then a diatribe about how the transgender community is also at odds. Yeah, I'm bigger to Santa. With itself and her presumptions that the community will fragment because of non binary people and tension partially generational over gender affirming versus gender non conforming. And her evidence for this just indicates she doesn't understand what non conforming means, nor that tra trans men and trans women aren't like en masse holding out for trans versions of man and woman to be legal designations. Trans women are women, trans men are. I mean, look, I, look I'm not going to address like, the specifics of it, but the idea that like there is a huge amount of discord within the TRA movement is a very valid point. So, you know, like even if like the worst case scenario, I guess it's like if you look at the specifics, which I'm not going to because I can't be bothered, that maybe Raymond's specific examples were bad, but I kind of suspect not considering that Raymond is correct about literally everything she said throughout all of human history. Um, what word would you use to describe prejudice against trans people? Well, the issue is, I, I don't, I don't really know what prejudice against trans people would look like, because again, what defines somebody as trans is their belief that a biological male can be a woman, and I don't think it's really appropriate to say you can be prejudiced against a belief. Um, so that's kind of the issue, you know, like, I don't really see how you can say, like, that you're prejudiced against the belief. Our men, in the Australia example, they wouldn't be the ones resigning themselves to the non-specific category. The point with Raymond is that all of this, all these talking points, all the specific concerns, they've been with the gender criticals since 1979, and they've barely been iterated upon. Because they're right. If you keep up with their contemporary arguments, you already know the playbook. Another element noted in her 1994 reissue... I, I do kind of like how like the idea of not changing is almost being presented like as if it's some kind of implied negative. And it's like, that's pretty good. Like, surely if your ideological position has changed dramatically, then that kind of suggests that your ideological position isn't right. Because it's like, well, what if it, you know, if it's changed already what you're selling now is probably wrong too. Like you're probably going to change into the future as well. Whereas with the gender critical movement, it's like, oh wait, you've been saying the exact same stuff for 50 years. That's consistency. That suggests that if we are saying all the same stuff, 50 years, you know, same stuff we said 50 years ago and saying this is correct, we're going to be saying it 50 years into the future too. And that I would say is quite a strength that, you know, it's not like, you have no idea what you're signing up for. It's like, no, what we believe, we believe, and we've believed it for 50 years. We're going to keep believing it, and we're going to keep advocating for it. Which, yeah, I wouldn't say that's a negative at all. Introduction is the apparent... Yeah, truth doesn't change, lies do. That's a good point. Tension over the idea that transness doesn't... De I mean, look, obviously, like, the thing is, I know people are going to bring up the whole, like, well, science has changed. The thing is, like, obviously, um, things can change, but... Like, things should change because there's a motivation for them to change. And, like, obviously you could say science should change some ways, but in a lot of ways science hasn't changed. Like, people, act, you know, focus on the fact that science has changed and different points of opinion have changed, but the majority of science really hasn't. Like, you know, science decided or, you know, worked out, I guess, that the Earth revolves around the sun hundreds of years ago and they still believe that you know sci like there's all these things which kind of through science have been established and they're still believed so like yeah actually 
you know, like generally speaking, if something's true, it's not likely to change very much. It might change a little bit every now and then as new information comes to light, but it's not going to change like dramatically. We construct gender, it reinforces it, which I would argue is true more of many radical feminist adherents, but here's what Raymond says. The Wait, ideal what? of gender, it be appropriated upon. If you keep up with their contemporary arguments, you already yeah, know the playbook. Nice. Another element noted in her 1994 reissue introduction is the apparent tension over the idea that transness doesn't deconstruct gender, it reinforces it. Yes. Which I would argue is true more of many radical feminist adherents, but here's what Raymond Well, you're wrong. says. The I mean, look, I'm not going to say there are no gender critical feminists who reinforce gender, but the thing is, like, gender ide critical ideas don't reinforce gender. The ideal of transgender is provocative. On a personal level, it allows for a continuum of Is Janice Raymond still alive? Like, that feels like something which I should know, but if she's still alive, that's kind of wild. Like, surely she's not still alive. She is still alive. So what's she doing? Like, isn't that, doesn't that seem kind of weird? Like, she started this, and yet you don't really see her doing much. Like, obviously I, I you know, get that she's kind of, you know, she's, so she's 79 right now, but it's just kind of weird that, like, I don't know, she's not um, out there you know, like you would think she would be like a, a guest of honor, at, um, you know, many kind of gender critical places. Huh, weird. Like maybe she's like totally retired, but you'd think like at least like some major people would be like, hey, you know, I really want to speak to you. Ah, uh, whatever, anyway. Um... Of gendered expression. On a political level, it never moves off this continuum to an existence in which gender is truly transcended. Its supposedly iconoclastic rebellion against traditional gender confinement is more- Oh yeah, that's a good point, yeah, it says the transgender empire. Yeah, good point. What a mistake. Style than substance. What good is a gender outlaw who is still abiding by the law of gender. And I get what she's going for there, but she's having the discussion in bad faith. There's a lack of, or indeed a refusal to understand that it's possible to inhabit traits that a given society has organized into a gendered category without reinforcing that categorization. Speak but yeah, sure, maybe, but not when you're literally relating your adherence to those things to the categorization. Like, yes, it's true that, like, if you are, you can engage in masculine behavior or you can engage in feminine behavior or, you know, masculine traits or masculine expression, feminine expression, all that kind of stuff, and not be said to be reinforcing those categorizations. But if you say, I am presenting as feminine and acting as feminine and fulfilling the traditional social role of being feminine, and therefore I'm a woman, at that point you definitely are reinforcing um those kind of sexist categorizations so yeah you're right but you're not actually describing the reality of trans identity or the kind of contemporary trans movement speaking candidly i used to think in terms similar to this particularly around trans expression of what one might call archetypes i found certain trans expression to be politically inconvenient in the face of the larger issue of deconstructing gender norms what raymond refers to as confinement here of course i wasn't going around telling people they were doing gender wrong or whatever because i'm only somewhat self-righteous and not a transphobe what do you mean like like the thing is, it's not like no one's walking around saying people are doing gender wrong. The point is, if you're doing gender at all, you are doing it wrong. Like, to do, like, gender is wrong. And also, like, how is it self righteous to tell people not to uh, engage with kind of sexist and oppressive systems, you know, that, that hold no purpose apart from to keep people down? Um, yeah, it's just nonsense. Speaking plainly, she means that trans women in inhabiting femininity are reinforcing the existence of the feminine as a category to yes. bring back Beauvoir that the trans women confirm the typified marks of the second sex. 
Or put another way still, the way that transphobe feminists would argue, that the traditional trans woman is a collection of feminine signifiers, a stereotype of real women. Well, a stereotype of women, the real is unnecessary. Here is the emergence of a theme within gender critical history, raising interesting questions, supplying terrible conclusions. There is Okay, well we've heard the interesting question. I'm interested to hear where we'll get to the terrible conclusions. Um Someone says, can you point to a, sorry, I've got something in my teeth. Um, can you point to a single gender critical person who isn't doing gender? The thing is, like, obviously, I'm not saying, like, obviously everybody's doing gender and that is wrong. The point is, like, the, then the question is, are you doing it enthusiastically? Is, in fact, a whole discussion one could have about what it means to signify gender, what expression means, and even the intersection of that with commodities and material goods. But... TERFs aren't trying to have that discussion when they raise these points. Ultimately, from her work, there is a sense of warped compassion. Remembering her worldview, trans people are simply unwell or have been duped by the medical industrial complex. Largely, the angle is one of helping people become conscious to their own plight. That yes. they are not women, that they are not men. From this, it's pretty clear why TERFs are outraged by the accusations of bigotry and transphobia. They're just trying to help. Perhaps less so for the broader gender-critical umbrella, though. Which is absolutely not to say that she's doing anything good, or indeed that her work ought to be excused of the dangerous precedent and roadmap it creates, one which leads us right to the modern day movement. I present none of this to try and rehabilitate the TERF ideology or members, and indeed, motivations change and are always varied within groups, but she forms a core. Here's a segment where Raymond more explicitly uses the term consciousness. What I advocate, instead of a counseling that issues in a medicalization of the transsexual's suffering, is a counseling based on consciousness raising. In the early stages of the current feminist movement, consciousness raising groups were very common. These groups were composed of women who talked together about their problems and directions as women in a patriarchal society. The language mirrors that of class consciousness, and implicit in that is that one could educate a trans person away from being trans, that they are misguided. Given where this goes later, such a mercy only truly extends to trans men, because Raymond sees them as women, and thus worth saving or salvaging. Having let her words stand on- Well look, I mean, probably thing else, the reality is that you're not going to, like, obviously, you're not going to change the minds of biological males with like consciousness raising where you all talk about the experiences of like what it's like to be oppressed because of course you know as the saying goes no group has ever um achieved liberation by appealing to the moral sensibilities of their oppressor like biological males are the oppressors of women so you're not going to kind of get them all together in a group and sing kumbaya and then they're gonna be like oh okay fine i'll stop kind of offensively caricaturing womanhood it's just not going to happen um, so yeah. On their own for a bit, let's talk about some contextual history and respond. Like, I mean, yeah, let me be clear, okay? I'm not saying there's no solution to the reality of, like, tr trans-identified males. Or, let's say, no solution that couldn't, uh, sorry, no solution that could help them. I'm not necessarily saying that trans-identified males only need to be kind of opposed at kind of in opposition to their own desires maybe there's a way of helping but it's certainly going to be a lot harder than with uh trans identified females who are actively engaging with a, an, a system that is directly oppressive to them the problem is trans identified males aren't engaging with a system that is oppressive to them they're engaging with a system that they are the kind of beneficiaries of to the book. Raymond claims the book is not centered on disdain for trans people, but on an indictment of the medical industry for preying on vulnerable people. And it is true that particular folks. Okay, I'll say, let's see. Um, uh, okay, is against people who are enthusiastically women. I mean, look, here's the thing, okay? The issue is, like, it's not so much about how you act or anything like that. It's about what you will claim to be true. Because obviously, 
there will be cis women or you know non-trans women who are not um they're sorry who are going to engage with gender a lot but they're not by the very fact of their kind of i guess purported existence saying that that is what makes them women conversely a biological male who is saying they are a woman is necessarily saying that there is something to being a woman beyond biological reality and that is i think a problem as far as fighting women's oppression is concerned um yeah like i mean ultimately though it's worth noting many gender critical feminists are also critical of um you know like things like um uh are also critical of um what's the word i'm looking for uh things like makeup and whatever else but you know obviously it can be depersonalized so you don't have to talk about like each individual woman doing this thing because of course there's nothing about being a woman that requires those th you know there's nothing about being a woman that uh reinforces patriarchy but there is something about being a so-called trans woman that does reinforce patriarchy focus is given to the medical industry's role in all of this the work seeks to condemn the medical industry in particular and also trans women who steal spaces from cis women to put it in the book's own terms masculine behavior is notably obtrusive it is significant that transsexually constructed lesbian feminists have inserted themselves into the positions of importance and or performance in the feminist community of note here is the fact that she's not upset at just any old trans woman, but at what she identifies as lesbian feminists and part of a movement. She's afraid that the woman's movement is being hijacked by men who are only doing this because they seek power in all things. And there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, it's worth noting, this is not like, the claim was from Janice Raymond, uh, this isn't about like a personal hatred um, of... Um, yeah, personal hatred of um, biological. Sorry, I'm. I'm sorry. I am focusing on the Lisa Michelle thing. Um, yeah, I mean, usually I use the term non-trans women if I'm specifically talking with reference to um, like I guess talking about the reality of women as people who do not identify as trans so i'm saying a woman who does not identify as trans um and that's kind of what i mean but whatever i mean usually i would just say a biological female or whatever else anyway um what was i saying so yeah sorry the claim was well uh you know i'm not against uh or i don't have any ill will towards trans identified males or you know transidentified individuals in general i'm just concerned about kind of the political implications and blah 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 and so far there's been nothing presented to contradict that in fact the section i cited is followed up with the anecdotal story of a trans woman in a position of power who felt so slandered and derided by raymond that she sandy stone wrote the foundational text of transgender studies the empire strikes back a post-transsexual manifesto i've read that book pesto and oh, sorry I, sorry it's not a book obviously it's an essay uh, but I did read it in a book. Went on to get a PhD. As someone who has made most of their life decisions because of spite, I am in awe. It is rather common in discussing Empire and Raymond to pick out- I like how, like, it's being presented as a positive that a biological male was angry about a woman hurting their feelings and, like, centered their entire life around it. It's like, isn't that just, like, what, you know, Sargon Macad does? But the morally mandating it out of existence quote and say, this is genocide. This is the source of the genocidal bent. But I think this quote deserves more dissection than that. Not for this. I mean, let's not forget on the subject of morally mandating. Let's not forget that um, Jesse Gender cynically presented an altered, doctored version of the quote where the words morally were removed, um, which was very not based. Sake of apologetics, but to really understand why this ideology isn't unnerving to the people within the movement, why they can say this stuff and not be self aware about it, why they think they're the good guys. Okay, I want to know why I think I'm the good guy.
Yes. While I'm more than certain that there are people who wish that transness itself could be made illegal, that isn't the tactic advised by Raymond. The next sentence after... I mean, look, like making trans itself illegal is <laughs> would be a bit difficult, you know, like whatever. The famous quote. I mean, yeah, saying you making transness illegal again, like it kind of feels like making flying illegal is I believe that the elimination of transsexualism is not best achieved by legislation prohibiting transsexual treatment and surgery, but rather by legislation that limits it and by other legislation that lessens the support given to sex role stereotyping, which generated the problem to begin with. Yes. That's still exterminationist wording and should not be taken lightly because it is, in fact, the allegedly moderate position that gender criticals argue today. Little legal restraint. No, sorry, let me clarify. As far as like contemporary gender critical movements, there are still some gender critical people who will like, or at least people who are generally considered to be within the gender critical movement, who like affirm, um, you know, like, like, you know, you got people like Debbie Hayton and things like that. Like, they're usually considered, uh, you know, adjacent to being gender critical. Um, so the reality is that um, there's like, you know, it, like nowadays, I would say this, that is the most extreme position. The position of actively wanting to use legislation to limit the proliferation of trans identity is an extremist position within the gender critical movement. It is, as it happens, a an extremist position I hold to, but I hold to that position knowing full well that it's pretty bloody high up there. And the majority of kind of gender critical people I've spoken to, and certainly the majority of gender critical people who um, are, you know, I guess like high profile, certainly have not said anything like that. I mean, I would say it, but you know, you've got to bear in mind, most gender critical people, like J JK Rowling, for example, hasn't even ever come out and said that trans women or trans identified males, aka, aren't women, as far as I know. Um, what video did Jesse gender misquote Raymond? Uh, the video, I think, is literally called, like, explaining gender critical or explaining TERFs. I've made a response to it. Um, so I don't know if you just go onto my video channel and look for my response to Jesse Gender, there's a video. It's either like explaining gender critical or explaining to us. Restrictions here and there, a patchwork of suppression. But there's one key bit to this. It's that ism thing again. In conjunction, the idea that transness is not a person's truth, but an ideology they hold, mixed with the distanced, make it legally impossible, not illegal approach. My tummy went rumbly. The gender criticals maintain an air of deniability, both internally among and within themselves and externally in their public face. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess. I mean, it's not really about deniability. It's just like, it's true. Like, obviously, it's not about any issues I have with personal individuals. It's just like a nonsense idea. Um, so, yeah kind of like i guess accurate but just being phrased in a weird way as if it's some kind of like something cynical they're not fighting against people they're fighting against a corrupting ideology well let's be clear we're fighting against the people who uphold that corrupting ideology um so there we go and yes queer panic also takes on this same paradigm arguing there is a reasonable version of homophobia being fine with gay people so long as they don't exist another thing to Look, I mean, the, the whole homophobia parallel is a bit weird because, like, I mean, like, homophobia is, I think, really thinking gay people, like, it's thinking gay people shouldn't exist. Um, but the point is, homophobia isn't an ideology. Oh, sorry, being homosexual isn't an ideology. Being gay isn't an ideology. It's a thing that you do because you like it. Um, you know, that's like saying playing laser tag is an ideology. Uh, at the end of the day, if two guys want to oh, really go at it, that's not an ideology. I don't know. I mean, is can bombing each other, <laughs> can that be an ideology? I just, I, if, it, if it is, I think it's fair to say it's not a robust ideology. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the reality is that obviously what this, I think, is trying to talk about is kind of the whole, um, like, gay pride movement uh which yeah maybe you could say is slightly more of an ideology and people might be against that but you know like the thing is it's kind of just a different thing like you're basically at this point you're basically just getting at the fact that like different things can be considered 
ideologies and um therefore like people might disagree with that i I don't really see what kind of the point that's supposed to be being made here is like yes i'm against trans identity because i think it's an ideological position um that doesn't speak to whether or not i'd be against um any other position that might be perceived to be ideological and indeed uh i'm not going to or you know i'm not on the verge of all right so indeed it is not parallel to any other ideology i might disagree with uh to any extent other than they both be ideological positions um Well done, Lee Baratineer. I feel like you've already given a super chat before and I didn't, um, you know, and I I would have pronounced your name then. Character holding their hands and their head in their hands saying, Incredible. I assume that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Um, I'll I'll, I'll act it out. Incredible. Like a French person, right? Like that's presumably how they would say it. Um... Yes. Uh, I've not been paying attention to the uh, Loris Tyrell dialogue happening, but it seems exciting. The thing to touch on real quick is the way Raymond casually refutes the existence of non-lesbian trans women, which lays the groundwork for a lot of contemporary transphobic arguments, while also weirdly- Can I just clarify? All trans-identified males, or so-called trans women, are (laughs) non-lesbian, because in order to be a lesbian you would have to be a woman. And no trans-identified male is a woman, but, you know, whatever. ...contradicting all the arguments made about how trans women are just men trying to escape their homosexuality, which we'll see later. Well, Well, look, I mean, if Janice Raymond, like, acted as if there's no such thing as trans-identified males who are attracted to males, then I guess, yeah, that's a rare Janice Raymond L, because obviously that's the thing. There's plenty of moments that stood out to me from a red flag transphobia perspective. There's one moment that stood out to me from an ideological perspective. The question of deception must also be raised in the context of how transsexuals who claim to be lesbian feminists obtained surgery in the first place. Since all transsexuals have to pass as feminine in order to qualify for surgery, so-called lesbian feminist transsexuals either had to lie to the therapists and doctors, or they had a conversion experience after surgery. This is one of those moments where she almost notices something. There's a tension between being and passing, and another between being accepted as trans and, to Raymond, accepted as a woman. But instead of recognizing that this tension is a product of societal constructs and constraints, she would argue that trans women only uphold the gender paradigm, both in terms of binary and power balance. What she implicitly... I have no idea what point was supposed to be made there. Like, as far as I'm concerned, what Janice Raymond said makes complete sense. Um, that basically, uh, you know, there are... A a so-called lesbian trans-identified male would obviously uh, be kind of... When they were a biological male, in being attracted to women, they would have been upholding traditional masculinity. And therefore, they would have to have contradicted that or in some way lied about that within the, you know... um, medical context of you know how transition worked at that time in the 1970s uh, in order to have even transitioned and that's a pretty obvious point i don't really understand what rosenkraut's criticism of that was supposed to be it seemed to not make any sense at all um you know i'm going to give okay i'm going to don't say i'm not generous i'm going to give it another shot seeing if this can make sense as a woman but instead of recognizing that okay this is one of those moments where she almost notices something Okay, so she almost noticed it. There you go. Good good news. The misogynistic dude is here to congratulate the woman for almost noticing something with her dainty little woman head. The tension between being and passing, and another between being accepted as... Okay, so there's a tension between being and passing. Yeah, obviously. Like, you can uh, say you are something without being perceptibly that thing to somebody else. Trans and to rain. I mean, for example, I would say that, you know, and obviously I know this is a disagreement, but 
I have argued that there are biological males, trans-identified males, who you could say do pass as women. And of course, my position would be that even if they pass as women, they aren't women. So even if they pass as women, they would still be men. Now, I know some people disagree with me, especially Lisa, love you, um, who will say like, no, no trans-identified male ever passes, whatever. The point is, I'm just giving it here as an example to show how, yes, there is obviously a difference between um, uh, passing and being. You might pass, or for example, I mean, let's say, for example, I... Um, got just surgery that made me totally just like seem black. Like every single person who saw me would think I was black. So I would pass as a black person, but I would be a white person. So again, there is obviously a difference between passing and being. Now, being and passing. Okay. And another between being accepted as trans and to Raymond, accepted as a woman. Okay, so that just seems like pretty obvious. Of course, there would be a difference between um, somebody, uh, you know, being accepted as trans and somebody being accepted as a woman. Like, ov obviously those two things are different. Like, again, that, that would just seem so obvious, but okay. But instead of recognizing that this tension is a product of societal... What do you mean tension? Is it, Like, how is that a tension? Like, wh where's the tension here? You have one thing which is just obvious, which is that being trans and being a woman are two different things. So, of course, you're going to be recognized as things in different ways. And though obviously passing as something and being something are also two different things. Therefore, like, so what's the tension here? There's no tension here. That's like saying, um, you know, I don't know, that uh, there's a difference between writing with your left hand and writing with your right hand. And the tension here needs to be explained or something like that or that this tension is called there's like there's no tension here that's just like reality itself constructs and constraints she would okay, that this tension is a product of societal constructs and constraints what 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 wait how are there constructs and constraints i mean i i would kind of agree but not really i mean obviously for example the fact that we constructed i guess the idea of somebody being black is the only way that I could pass as black. But the thing is, like, the biological signifiers I would be impersonating would still exist. So I guess it's kind of true, maybe? But so what? Okay, like, and as for constraints, though, I mean, maybe. But okay, I'm not, I'm not really sure what the point is here. Like, yeah, I guess it's true that... The, the exist existence of constructs might allow somebody to pass as something other than what they are. Um, like, obviously, if there was no construct about what it meant to be a woman, then it would be impossible for me to pass as a woman because nobody would know what that meant. I'm not sure what the point's supposed to be. Okay, let's... She would argue that trans women only uphold the gender paradigm, both in terms of binary and power balance. Yes. Okay. So we went through it really slowly. I broke down every single statement made. What the hell was, is the point this person is trying to make? Rosenkrauts? Damn it, Rosen... Doesn't Rosenkrauts? I don't know why. For me, it sounds like a kind of, like, person who would always be, like... Like, the boss would always be angry. Or like, in, like, a sitcom or something. Like, Rosenkrauts! Um, and that's my attitude right now. Like, what the hell are you on about? What she implicitly asks for is something common to contemporary talking points, that affirmation must be earned, but one cannot be trusted in their transition without proof. Well, who's saying affirmation must be earned? Wait, like, where, where is... In fact, I would argue, like, I, Janice Raymond, one, didn't say that, and two, if she did say that, then I would, you know, disavow her entirely. You should not be... The idea that your identity as a man or woman is something that is earned is entirely contrary to gender critical ideas. Proof of affirmation. What to Raymond then would be the. Okay, I'm not even going to respond to the second, like the but thing, because I kind of pulled this halfway through. But the thing is, the first claim was wrong. Raymond doesn't believe that affirmation must be earned. The starting point. From where does one enter the being passing cyclical justification? What she has done here is highlight an element of a broken system. What do you mean, being passing cyclical justification? There, there is no cyclical justification. The two things really don't relate to each other. Like, again, you can pass as something, but not be something. So there is no cyclical justification. 
system and blamed those who are being crushed by the system for trying to survive it. The supposed compassion of her book. Look, you can blame someone for trying to survive something if they're trying to survive that thing by cynically engaging with it. Like, I can understand if you're just trying to survive the system, but I can still blame you for it. Like, if you're a kind of class traitor because you want to get them capitalist bucks, well, I can recognize what you're doing, but I can still blame you for it. The book comes from an arrogant place of knowing better, a parental and, I would say, very heteropatriarchal idea of how to guide someone to the proper gender expression. Look, I mean, believing in reality and affirming reality, if that's like knowing better, then that's pretty sad. Like, it's pretty sad for anybody who interprets it that way. Just with a different line drawn than before. One of the ideas behind queer theory is that of norms. How one defines a norm and what changing a norm <laughs> I'm just thinking about like a uh, cheers. Norm <laughs> does. Ultimately, we will be faced with the question of if we are merely inviting more behaviors into normalcy or if we ought to deconstruct the ideas and ideologies that handed us these norms. What a Raymond does is far more the former starting an enduring tradition of antagonism between lesbian radical feminism and queer theory. Wait, what? I, okay, that seems... Did, did that just imply that Janice Raymond believes in upholding traditional femininity? Because she doesn't. And you haven't shown that she does. Oh, okay, this, this is getting embarrassing. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going, but this is, this is not good. Sheila Jeffries is another lesbian feminist academic. Though where Raymond deviated her interest to sex work and trafficking, Jeffries has developed and sustained an academic antagonistic relationship with queer theory. Aside from that, Boom. some of her interests include discussions of beauty standards as male dominance manifesting, yes. sadomasochism as male dominance manifesting, and transness as male dominance manifesting. <laughs> Those feminists always complaining about male dominance. It just comes across as like so misogynistic and anti-feminist to have someone like making fun You hear that weird noise? I have no idea, like, I don't know, maybe there's just some, like, weird vibration noise happening. Anyway, yeah, like, it comes across as so, like, misogynistic and anti-feminist to be like, oh, those, those feminists always complaining about male dominance, like, basically just making fun of her for being like, oh, she believes this is male dominance, and this is male dominance. Oh, those women, they just see male dominance everywhere, don't they? It's literally like the kind of conservative, oh, you black people see racism everywhere kind of take. Like, imagine, like, me saying that exact same thing about, like, a black person. Like, she sees, or, you know, he, he or she sees this as race, racial oppression, and this as racial oppression, and this as racial oppression. I mean, like, that would sound kind of like the type of thing, like I say, a conservative uh, kind of anti-racial justice person would say, doesn't it? Interesting. Each of these will return in some capacity because they are, to Jeffries, inseparable. In Unpacking Queer Politics, Sheila Jeffries claims that queer space, because of the gay male dominance of its politics, emulates and thus reinforces the oppressiveness of heterosexual culture. Her focus is on the origin of the deviation from the aligned gay and lesbian agenda of the 1970s, which saw a shift from sexism and thus gender and gender roles as their mutual opponent, to the political focus on acceptance of the gay as natural within the realm of gender roles, which, to her, further empowers gender roles. The inclusivity of the queer umbrella and the acceptance of trans people ultimately caused a weakening of the lesbian agenda. Queer seeks to lump in lesbians, and in doing so, imposes a microcosm of patriarchy where the agenda of queer is ultimately shifted towards in that's a really good point. That's like such a solid point. I've never even like had that pointed out before, but yeah, that's true. Necessarily, if you are ever going to create a movement that will not be kind of uh, in any way sex segregated, then you are creating a movement that will just be a microcosm of society itself, and therefore patriarchy will manifest in it, right? Like, so if I create a socialist movement then that is just going to probably be a broad cross-section of society, meaning it will have males in it as well as females, which means it will just be a microcosm of patriarchy, and therefore patriarchy will still exist. And that's, and of course, yes, forcing lesbians into a lesbian and gay movement, never mind trans, um, means that you are putting them 
in a movement with biological males, and therefore you are just turning your movement into a microcosm of patriarchy, and that's a really good point. Uh, so thank you, Rosenkrantz, for um, presenting this actually really good question, um, uh, or really good objection from Sheila Jeffries. Enforcing the power, positions, and privilege of its primary theorists, who happen to be white males. However, you're a white male. <laughs> you're a fucking white male. I know that's like kind of not appropriate because like obviously the, the white male thing is accurate, but I just find it like a funny meme. These theories were written in 2003 about the 70s onward, so discussing the past 30 years almost 20 years ago and have carried with them a certain practice. I would argue that it isn't controversial to say that queer theory, queer politics, and queer lives are fairly distinct spheres, and that arguing there is a leader cast of theorists twisting the politics in order to benefit themselves rather than the people is misguided. Phil who said that? Who said that there's like these leaders who are ruining everything? I'm pretty sure Sheila Jeffries is entirely, would be entirely willing to recognize that this is actually influenced by impersonal forces. Philosophy touches all of our lives. I mean, look, I'm not going to say there's like nobody who is cynically kind of grifting. Because yeah, there's definitely going to be individuals who have some culpability. But it seems like Sheila Jeffries would be entirely willing to accept also the idea that there is, like I say, uh, impersonal forces of oppression involved. Lives, but we don't go around defining our daily interactions using Kantian ethics. Likewise, activists don't exist to just expand the rights of the ruling class. Put another way, queer theory doesn't map onto reality so neatly, but it isn't meant to. People weren't marching against Good excuse. the AIDS crisis in order to, like, buy Foucault a new car. What Jeffries means by enforcing the privilege of theorists is a coded discussion of the oppressor sex slash transgressive predator concept. She's implying here that queer theory is just people like Foucault trying to destroy laws that hold men back from being unstoppably transgressive. Or to be blunter, she's saying queer politics is a sock puppet for sex criminals trying to decriminalize sex crimes. I mean, look, saying look like that's the problem the problem with that is like in and of itself it's too reductive like you can't say that queer theory in and of itself is entirely that because queer theory is lots of things there's lots of motivations society is complicated is it perhaps very much to the advantage of those who do want to uh, open the door to kind of rethinking all transgressions and kind of our judgment of all transgressions in order to make it so that their you know criminal sexual behavior can be viewed as excusable. Yeah, I'd say that's a reasonable possibility. Um, so yeah, I think as far as I'm concerned there, it's the difference between if the claim is uh, from Sheila Jeffries, this is what the queer theory movement, you know, this is why the queer theory movement exists. This is the singular reason, just so it can be a sock, a sock puppet for sex criminals. Well, yeah, I would say that's nonsense. But if it's, this is one of the reasons why the queer theory movement kind of exists and one of the motivations behind the direction the queer theory movement is taking, yeah, that would seem very credible. I don't think this video will be monetizable. Let's talk about how Jeffries sees queer politics and its relation to power, and then we can get into transgression. There's a position within lesbian feminism that holds on to some of the material feminist roots of fatigue. Jeffries herself aligns with that group. The second chapter of the book starts with a condemnation of neoliberalism and the general complacency of the 1980s. This she extends to the broader queer movement. They, the queer slash LGBT group, are, are out, yeah, queer, queer theory is peak neoliberalism. Again, pushing for a normativization, according to Jeffries. Going further, we see remarks towards the queer participation in capital and commodity markets where practices that gay liberationists had analyzed as resulting from oppression were commodified by business interests, as in bathhouses and transsexual surgery, they were celebrated in the new queer politics instead of criticized. Okay, and here we are, repeating the idea of trans surgery as nominally a commodity. And there is one hell of a conversation to be had about class and doing transness, but that is not today. Um, hey there, Hole. Uh, despite the claim that you should grab a chair, get some snacks, and have a nice time, there is probably about 10 minutes until I'm going. Well, you know, 10 minutes is enough time to have a snack. Nor am I sure I'm equipped to facilitate that discussion. 
More immediately relevant is how this ties back to Raymond and the medical industry angle, this argument that trans people are, in some sense, being exploited financially, which reads as diagnosing a problem but offering an insufficient solution. There is one thing Jeffries is kind of right about. Yeah, saying to just be happy with your body and not spend money to get it changed um, is, you know, that's not a solution. About And it may just be something that draws lesbians towards the turf mindset. All the principles of lesbian feminism came under attack in the 1980s and 1990s. Separate lesbian organizing, culture, and existence were attacked as Get the bell on everyone, get that bell on. If you want that bell on, like, hit the bell right now, okay? Like, look, right down, right down there, there's a bell. Where is it? I need to look at someone else's um, channel. Wait, where is it? Do they even have a bell? Or do you have to subscribe first? Oh yeah, okay, so you gotta subscribe first. And then next to the subscribe button, there's a bell, okay? And what you want to do is you want to hit that bell. You don't want to smash that bell. You want to make that bell go ding, 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 ding. Um, and then, well, that's it. Yeah, you've done it. So well done. Some lesbians in the 1990s developed a newly close relationship with gay men in queer politics. Woman loving was regarded with suspicion as masculinity became the highest value in a mixed queer culture. She notes that the trend of coalescing queer organizations, a mixed queer culture as she puts it, reconstructs gender hierarchy in its interests. Male interests are prioritized, handled first. Gay men have the most to gain from the coalition and only nominally uplift women when it's an everybody wins type situation. Yeah, so this is basically a repeat of what we've already said about the whole, if you have a movement with biological males and biological females, you just created a microcosm of society where patriarchy is still going to exist. Again, interesting thing to question, but the conclusion leaves something to be desired. From there, Jeffries essentially extends Raymond's condemnation of trans identities for their reconstruction of gender to the entirety of the queer, in that queer has reintroduced the gender inversion understanding of homosexuality. She's saying that by associating with the dastardly transes, queer has regressed the L's and the G's back to a trapped in the wrong body understanding of what it is to be a gay man. A very legitimate point, and of course, yes, it used to be that, um, you know, people thought, I mean, yeah, obviously, it's what's just said there, it used to be thought that men were women trapped in the bodies of men. Um, that was an idea, and like, you know, Germany... Uh, I mean, I think actually in like a lot of kind of Western Europe uh, in the kind of early 20th century and late 19th century. Or lesbian woman, which is awfully similar to the way Raymond worried about sex role stereotyping. Lesbians are absorbed into the queer movement and subsequently declawed because the movement as a whole is, again, participant in neoliberal power structures and patriarchy, according to Jeffries which leads her to lines like this. The lesbians who fled radical lesbian feminist analysis of sexuality entered into a queer politics which was founded upon a traditional masculine notion of sexual freedom. This traditional view is represented historically by those gentlemen such as the Marquis de Sade, whose power and privilege included the right to access women and children at will, both mm. inside and outside marriage. Not all lesbians are worthy are politically pure. Because remember, being a lesbian who is political and being a political lesbian or being a lesbian politically are very different. This ability to choose purity leads to the possibility that a lesbian can be wrong in how- Okay, none of this has anything to do with trans identity. So we're just gonna kind of like, like at the end of the day, any kind of intra-lesbian beef is not something that I'm gonna really engage with because it's just, you know, whatever. If someone wants to have particular criticisms of how lesbianism is expressed and all that kind of stuff, whatever. You know, like, that's that's not what my channel's about, and it would not really be appropriate for that to be what my channel's about. How they are a lesbian. Much the same to the whole of non-cis-hetero peoples and movements. That's where it goes. And Jeffries imagines, at the helm of this queer hydra, the Marquis de Sade, or those who he symbolizes, elite men, sadomasochists, transgressors. 
Critical to Jeffries and her dissection of queer and trans politics is understanding what she means when she uses the term transgression, which Jeffries credits to Butler by way of Foucault. I'll try not to get too deep into explaining queer theory and post-structuralism in order to describe Jeffries' idea here, but the occasional dip into it all might be inevitable. For a quick glance into her uh, perspective on the relation between queer politics and lesbian feminism, there's this. Pause to read it if you like, it's an interesting mix of funny, self-aware, blind, and ultimately ignorant of what performance means within queer theory and post-structuralism. Oh, I'm only going to read it because at the end of the day, uh, I feel like I've been spending way too much time just agreeing with what's being presented and then be disappointed, you know, and then being disappointed at the inability of Rosenkrauts to offer up any indication that I shouldn't be agreeing with what's being presented. Awesome. From that, we enter into transgression. You should check out Dworkin's response to Boivar's. Is that in my my understanding? I might be wrong, but isn't doesn't Dworkin talk about Dassard in one of her books? In which case, I think I'm pretty sure I've read it. Like I remember reading Dworkin talking about Dassard, um, but I, it could be that she's spoken about him several times. But I remember in one of her books, probably you know, the one about adult content. Um, she mentioned Dassard. Within queer theory, the idea of a revolutionary activism that might challenge the material power differences between the sexes, of which gender is simply the expression, has been replaced by the idea derived from Judith Butler's work that transgression on the level of dress and performance is revolutionary and will bring down the gender system. Transgression is a comfortable kind of nightclubbing activism. It consists of carrying out sexual practices seen to- Okay, yeah, so I guess I'll just say it because I hate to say it. Um, I agree with this. Um, yeah. Like, obviously, just, um, you know, dressing up as a woman isn't going to, you know, a biological man dressing up as a woman is not going to tear down the patriarchy. To be outlawed under conventional mores does not require changing laws, going on demonstrations, or writing letters. It can be achieved by doing something that gay men and lesbians may always have enjoyed, whilst relabeling it politically transformative in and of itself. Thus, nightclubbing, if in rubber or gender-inappropriate clothing, can come to be seen as political action. In essence, her critique is that transgression is just slacktivism, and perhaps there's something to be explored in that idea, though I think it's a bit reductive when we live in a world where being queer is politicized, where one, in simply being, in inhabiting queerness, is turned into the subject of politics. As an aside, I do find it I I don't really see how that's relevant. Like, okay, but that doesn't really change the fact that it's not, you know. I mean, it doesn't really change the point being made, or if it does, it hasn't been communicated how that substantially changes the point being made. It's striking for her to start this section with a condemnation of the collaboration between queer politics and neoliberal power structures, and that her suggestion of what real politicking is begins and ends with letter writing campaigns and civil engagement? Yeah, sorry, the radical heart of gay movements was torn out by the queers, but also, here's my suggestion, email your local representative. Okay, so I guess, yeah, like, that's, that's an okay kind of point being made by Rosenkrauts there, but obviously that's not like a particularly extreme form of, um of activism but having said that it's still more extreme than just going out to a nightclub like yeah i guess she's saying that like you know she's offering up kind of a comparison between uh going to a nightclub dressed in you know leather or whatever um and letter writing rather than comparing it to i don't know an armed revolution to overthrow heteropatriarchy but still She's kind of making a point. Like, I don't know, like, it's kind of, I guess it's a bit disingenuous to assume that, like, just because you make an analogy to some kind of more moderate form of political activism, you're therefore saying that's the full extent of the activism you'd support. I can't think of anything more trite than saying that existing beyond norms doesn't do enough to deconstruct norms when one could instead be writing stern letters. 
Which is to say nothing of the fact that, uh, citation needed, yeah? What kind of presupposition is this that the queers don't also engage with politics beyond existing? I get what she's saying. She didn't say that line. All she said is you can't act as if you're, like, tearing down gender just for being gender nonconforming in itself without, like, actively making a kind of more substantial politically organized criticism of the system of gender about the nominal passivity of existing and all, but to follow it up with anything short of a call to active civil disobedience is comical. And that's not even strictly my suggestion, but to act like lesbian feminism and its parallel power structure is dreaming big, shame queer movements for perceived lack of initiative, and offer up nothing more than an, alas, too many people are doing gender wrong according to my politics, coupled with wistful reminiscing about the radical King Critical deliberately misunderstands the videos he reacts to in these live streams. He is not actually engaging with the points raised. He just makes long videos for the sake of length. I'll have you know that we're fucking like killing this. I mean, you know, I say that. Like, this is only going to take two parts. It's an hour long video. Um, I mean, look, obviously that's just like a, a dumb thing because, you know, like, uh, if you say I deliberately misunderstand something, then there's no way I can respond to that, because if I say, no, I don't, then if you think I'm deliberately misunderstanding stuff, there's, you, you've, like, at that point, created a situation where there is nothing that I can possibly say. Once you've allowed for, uh, you know, a kind of explanation for my behavior that extends to me intentionally making many, many YouTube videos where I just intentionally avoid understanding the, you know, what's being said, uh, there's nothing I could say that you could take as me engaging in good faith so yeah whatever i mean all i'll say is earlier on i literally there was a moment where a point was made and i didn't understand the point so i went back and went through literally every single individual point that was made to be like okay let me see if i can actually get what's trying to be said and i like every single thing that was said i like repeated it um and blah 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 um to be like okay that's what's being said that's being said blah 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 and um then at the end of it there was you know it still wasn't a substantial point he's like Muller that's really funny because I actually referenced Muller in one of my videos a while ago uh I referred to him as my favorite um I said he was one of my favorite radical feminists I can't remember the context but I said like something like I'm gonna make a video that's needlessly long just like my favorite radical feminist, Mula. So there we go. Good, good reference. 70s is absurd. To sum up, what she's saying is that being out of the closet and present is not enough. But one ought to question her aims. Okay, I was going to say we should reach the end of this section, but no, we're not going to have to reach the end of this section. Um, okay. This feels like, like, so, so far it's literally just been Monique Wittig, who by this person's very own admission, is not was not really gender critical and then a section on Janice Raymond and now we're on Sheila Jeffries and we seem to be on Sheila Jeffries until the end in saying this the answer is to construct the second angle of attack transgression has a long history amongst upper class males perhaps you can sense where this is going it you know what actually I just realized we're probably just about to run out of battery so let's say that this is over um I don't really care where we are um, you know, I, I, see, isn't this going to look funny? Because, you know, it just shows how terrified I am of Douglas. Um, but what it actually is, of course, is that we're almost at the two hour mark, which is, you know, I like to end there anyway. Also, I need a tinkle. <laughs> anyway, you know, it occurs to me, I've totally like forgotten to do the whole like ending as if it's the ending of an actual video now. But I suppose I should say like, if anybody's watching this, because like, I, I don't know, the whole thing's worth it. But yeah, if I'm... If people are watching this who haven't watched any of our stuff, obviously subscribe, like, comment, all that stuff. That is really appreciated. Patreon and all that, obviously, shout out to... Um, I'm going to remember his name because there's no way I would forget his name. Um, his name is uh, Lee. There we go. Baratineur for the super chat. Really appreciated. Um, and apart from that, yeah, I'll just say thank you, everybody. Thank you to everyone who gives on Patreon. Um, and I will see you, I don't know, maybe tomorrow. Qu'est-ce que tu fais, you know? Um, all right.
Bye, everybody. It was nice seeing you all here today.